So Galatians uh, chapter five, and this is this is um, part two of our of our series in the fruit of of the spirit. It's actually going to go on for a few weeks because I'm going to take a bit more time over this week by week by week rather than just kind of rushing through. Um, but just let me read uh, Galatians uh, chapter five, verse twenty two. This is what it says: "But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness." faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each each other. Absolutely fantastic um, scripture. Now, now last week we, we saw, didn't we, that there are um, two sets of fruits mentioned in Galatians. Um, first of all, uh, there's the fleshly fruits, which the which Bible calls the acts of the flesh, which are bad. I'll give you a clue. They're bad. You have things like it uh, mentions in there, things like um, sexual immorality, um, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, all of those things there. Those are bad, right? Nobody be under, uh, under any illusion about it. They are bad fruits. And this week, um, we're looking at the spirit-led fruits, um, which are good fruits, um, to mentioned in Galatians chapter 5 from verse um, 22 onwards, uh, then, uh, 22 to 24. Those are good fruits. And, and when you read uh, through Galatians, um, you see at verses 17 to 18 and a half, it shows us how there is this spiritual tug of war going on between us, between, uh, between what we know is good and what we know is bad. And the Bible says um, that there's conflict. Yeah, there's a real conflict, like this tug of war or like, like hand-to-hand combat. But there is huge good news in all of this, absolutely fantastic good news. There is the promise that if we keep in step with the Spirit, as is mentioned in verse 25 in there, that said, um, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. There's, there's a promise there that if we consistently, continuously and deliberately follow Jesus day in, day out, then we are going to be growing in him. It's when we ignore Jesus completely that the fruit starts to wither on the vine and they don't grow. But if we consistently, continuously and deliberately follow after Jesus and read his word, keep in fellowship, pray, all the things which we know that we should do, that's when that fruit keeps on growing. So this week we are going to, um, as I said, look at the fruit of the spirit. And notice the word where it says, it says the fruit of the spirit, not the fruits of the spirit. Now, often I, I get all tongue-tied and I, and I keep on saying, oh, the fruits of the Spirit, because there's lots of different parts to it, but I'm going to explain that. Well, the Greek word for um, fruit here is the word karpos, which is K-A-R-P-O-S. If you think of like carpol, except miss out the L on the end, karpos, which means, and this is what it means, I'll read this. It means fruit, which is a growing, living thing and is produced much the same way as real-life fruit, fruit like an apple, say. So that's what that means. You know, the fruit of the spirit is, in the original language, it means that it's fruit like on a tree. So, for example, out, out in the garden just now, we've got apple trees and there's, there's the apple buds, but there's some tiny apples there which will grow about the size of my fist they do every year. So this is what I was talking about. They, these are fruit which grows um, are much the same as organic fruit. And that, and that happens when we get close to Jesus. Also, if, if you look at an orange, and I'm looking forward to this little demonstration today. Here's one I prepared earlier. And um, if we look at it, it's a hole, isn't it? This is it's called an orange or a tangerine. And if we peel it a little bit, and uh, we get some of the, and we get some of the skin off, you know, we look inside it, and we see that you've got the lovely um, segments, you know, which are really quite tasty. These are these are actually quite sharp. And um, we see these individual segments like that. Mmm, yum, 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 yum. Very nice indeed. Lots of segments. Very individual, if, if you take them apart, they'll all be individuals. But when you put them together, they're all part of the fruit. I can see that, you know, so it makes up the whole fruit. Each of these individual segments, it makes up the whole fruit. Same as the fruit of the spirit here with love, joy, peace, and so on. You're by themselves, they're tasty, but they all go together to make one whole. And so, and so it is here because the word fruit is actually singular. In the original language, it just means it's not plural, it's actually singular, which means that the fruits are a unified whole, not independent characteristics, 
that survive alone of the other. So for example, if you say to me, well, I've got lots of love, but I've got no self-control, I'd have to say to you, well, actually, you know, you, you, haven't, got any, you haven't got the fruit. Can you see? Whereas when we look at the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you can have tongues or healings or different things. You can have one or two, or sometimes more, but when it comes to the fruit of the Holy Spirit, we are required to have the lot, all of them, okay? And we've got to remember that. And, and we have to show all of these things in a life, but that's, that's when we press into Jesus. That's how we grow in his ways. And the same as, as physical fruit um, needs time to ripen, to ripen, so it is with us and the fruits of the Holy Spirit. We often have to do some serious weeding in the first few years or even months of, of our Christian life. I know for myself that when I first got saved, there were lots of things in my life which were still very wrong. And I, I had to do some serious weeding. I, I was very racially prejudiced. I was very nasty. I was, I, I was full of anger and hatred. And Jesus had to get all of those different things and had to work in them so that these fruits could start to grow. So that where there is hatred, there is peace and gentleness and kindness. Can you see? Uh, you know, so sometimes we have to have that really severe weeding. But then as we grow in Christ, we then have to be careful that we don't get these sly weeds suddenly come in. So all of a sudden, you know, we start to either get proud or always have a bits and pieces as well. And do you remember a couple of weeks ago um, when we looked at uh, the gifts of spirit? One of the things we talked about was discernment, about distinguishing the spirits. Remember we talked about that? And we said that one of the things that they are that's used for is to tell when something's right or wrong. So you get that feeling, oh, oh, that's very wrong, or oh, that's very right. But sometimes the other thing which I didn't which I didn't say about is that sometimes the sermon is used when things um, are right or almost right. Can you see that? So sometimes your yeah, things can seem right, but they're almost right. And if something's almost right, it's not correct. It's a bit like if you're measuring something up. Yeah, you know, suppose that you want to put something across here. Your mirror could say he's a builder, and let's suppose that I have it say six millimeters too long or something like that well it's not going to fit it's going to like that and if i say well it's almost right the american would say well it's not right it needs to be six millimeters exactly shorter to fit and that's perfectly right so that's something as well which i wish the sermon is used for when things are almost right so we just have to be a little bit careful of that so that brings us nicely on to the first fruit of the spirit verse 22 but the fruit of the Spirit is love. So that's the first thing we're going to look at. Now, there's lots of biblical words, um, biblical Greek words and Hebrew words for the word love. But there are four main words which we just kind of need to be aware of. The first one is a word called storgy, which means empathy or a bond with somebody. You know, so, for example, you know, you can, you, know, you can like somebody. think, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, I can, you know, I can understand how you feel. There's that one. There's, there's philia, which is, which is the friendship one you know we have like brotherly love you can be friends of people and that sort of stuff um the, uh, the third one which is mentioned in scripture is eros which is which is sexual love of which we uh, get the word erotic but the main word that we look at which which concerns us is the word agape which is a-g-a-p-e i think there might be another e on the end who knows you know my spelling's not the best at you know at the best of times and that's agape love which is the unconditional God-sized love. And this is the love which is mentioned here. Agape love. It's the love that God show us that when we read in the scriptures, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, so, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but, re but receive eternal life. For God so loved. That's the agape love. That unconditional, um, unselfish, not wanting anything back love. So what, what does this love look like? We could talk about that, but first we're gonna see what it, it doesn't look like so you can compare the two. Well, agape love is not what we see in the world today. It's as rare as rock and horse teeth. What we see, the kind of love that we hear about in our society is this kind of wishy-washy, um, sentiment, uh, sentimental, um, emotion-driven uh, feelings that can change with the wind. How many times have you heard people say in your life, oh, I love you, and then five minutes later, oh, I don't love you anymore? Well, that's not agape love. That's, that's the worldly kind of love, which changes. 
and often it's um, popularity driven or tweet driven or Facebook driven or, or what's the other thing, Inst instant snap, insta Instagram or, or snap, I always get the words, or Snapchat, 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 all, all of these different things there. Um, you know, people base how much people love them on how many likes and things that you get. But there's no deep commitment. There's no kind of love. There's no kind of, there's nothing really. It's only based on what you can get back. Listen to what John's Gospel says in chapter 15. John's Gospel, chapter 15 and, and verse 12. This is what it says. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Wow, my command is this, agape each other as I have agaped you. Greater agape has no one than this to lay down one's life as his friend. That unconditional love, that's the picture of love that the Bible points. That's the picture of the fruit of love in our lives, which, which we are called to have. And it's this, it's this um, absolutely amazing love. Because let's just look at Jesus in the Gospels. What did Jesus do? Well, Jesus touched lepers. He was friends with the social underdogs of the day. He shared and spoke unconditionally. He gave that love. He gave that costly, costly love, which eventually um, cost him everything. So we need to be careful about the kind of love that we talk about or get involved with. Right? This may sound a little bit strange about this because some people say, oh, well, all you've got to do is love. Well, no. There's a lot of folks who sincerely believe that love is all it takes to change the world, to bring nations together, to, to end poverty, right? There's a lot of people. And there's been a lot of talk recently, you know, sort of the press about love, 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 love. You know, love can bring nations together. Well, actually, love doesn't. And I'm gonna tell you why. Because what that kind of love is that they're talking about, when they talk about love can end poverty and we can all get together, that's talking about that filial love, that brotherly love, that kind of friendship love that wants to help out, but there's no power. It's, it's really not good enough to do it. But what is actually needed for those things to take place is the agape love that, of Jesus, with that total commitment based solely upon the complete love of God, shown in the form of Jesus, powered by the Holy Spirit within us, and working through you and I. That's what changes things, not just, oh, that's just love. Oh, that's just love, because it's baseless. There's no commitment there. But what really changes, like I said, is that agape love, where there's a commitment and we show that love of Christ, because for people's lives to be changed, whoever it is, it comes from the heart. It really does. And that's a world changer, when we can bring that agape love into play in everything that we do. And what amazes me is, is that the first segment that we read about of the fruits is, is love. It's a love which is so powerful that it can push back hell itself from a sinner's life. When you accept Jesus Christ and you realize, oh my word, there's a God who loves me despite all that I've done and all the things that nobody else knows about, all the sin, all the, all the horror, all the, all the hideousness of my life, and yet God still loves me. That's that agape love. And for me, this, I have to say that but for some people, love seems to be this thing which is kind of up there somewhere. But for me, love is a very, very uh, practical thing. You know, to, you know, to show that love, unconditional love. If, if somebody needs something, just give it to them. You know, don't expect anything back. That's what the Bible says. You know, if, if somebody asks you for your coat, you know, give to them your, your tunic as well. If somebody asks you to go with them one mile, go with them a second mile. You know, so we're always giving. We're always showing that love of Jesus. That's what changed. Where, or in fact, what happens sometimes in the world is, oh, yeah, I'll help you, but you've got to do this for me. That isn't love. That isn't love at all. But the agape love is when we help. Think about it again. Jesus touched lepers. Wow. He, he washed feet. He fed the hungry. He wiped away the tears of loss. Think about our brother Lee today. We're going to be, as a church, we're going to be wiping away his tears of loss. He mixed with 
sexual sinners. He mixed with sex workers, the prostitutes. He mixed with, he mixed with the Pharisees, with, with Roman soldiers, all of these different people. And, and he forgave them who wronged him and hurt him. That's that, that's that agape love, which we're called to have as the fruit. And he calls us to that same type of love. Now, you might not believe me, but this, let me read this to you. Right, again, from John's Gospel, chapter 13 and verse 34. This is what it says. A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Wow. By this, everyone will know that you're, you are my disciples. If you love one another. Oh, my word. <gasps> That's, that's almost breathtaking when you look around at society today. A new command I give you, agape one another. Love as God loves us. As I have agape you, so you must love one another. Isn't that powerful? Absolutely powerful. That is what makes people sit up and look. That is what, um, for me, signifies when a church is really moving in God, when there is love for one another, but not just like a little club. But when you're hearing stories of people outside sharing the gospel with people and um, helping people out, that is that fruit of the spirit of, of love. So that's why that first fruit is mentioned of love. So just let me, just let me challenge us. How do we do in, in loving others of the Jesus way? It's a challenge, isn't it? Sometimes I do better uh, some days than other days. Other days I can be absolutely glamorous in what I do, you know, with, you know, loving people. Other days I can be, I can be almost sinister you know, in, my, in my lack of concern, and I'm aware that I have to work in that. You know, so yes, that's me, and, and I'm sure we're all the same. And if you think about it, relationships sometimes can be the toughest of things to deal with, you know, when it comes to love. But listen to what Jesus says. Love your enemies. Oh, my word. Cool. I remember a few years ago when the Lord said to me, you know, about loving my enemies. There's a particular person who really was an enemy. And I thought, you're having a laugh, Lord. You know, surely this word can't be for me. You know, that's for somebody else. You know, but then that day this person hurt me a bit more with something. Else. I thought, oh, my word, that is for me. I had to learn to love this enemy, not love what they did. But God's word says love them in the same way that Jesus does. Or how about loving your neighbour? Oh, well, you know the problems we had <laughs> with our neighbours. My word, that tested me. Love, how about loving those who persecute you? If you're a Christian in this day and age, if you speak out about any, almost anything, you'll, you know, somebody will have a go. But we've got to love them, not agree with them. How about loving those who curse you and mistreat you? That happens all around the world. Today, there are people who are going to be killed for the sake of becoming a Christian or for being a Christian. There'll be people who will be beaten and tortured today. So how do we love? Well, it comes from that fruit of Holy Spirit working in, inside of us. Yeah, and that is tough at times, isn't it? It can be very tough at times to love those who have hurt you. And sometimes, what I have to say is, is, is sometimes the greatest act of this love, do you know what it is? Is to say two words or two letters, no. Sometimes that's the greatest act of love that we can give to anybody. Because God says no to us at times. If you remember the acts of flesh, which, which, I, read, which I read about, say so about anger, hatred, discord, jealousy, all of these different things. There's no good you coming to me and saying, well, do you know what, today I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit of hatred towards that person. You know, um, is it okay? I'd say, no, it's not. Because God's word tells us, no, it's not. And sometimes it's actually easier to hate somebody than it is to love them. Sometimes it's actually easier to, uh, to envy somebody than to actually to bless them. It really is, but God's word says no to those things. And it's not love, actually, uh, to agree or encourage um, and this false love and these false actions that we see around the world these days. And for example, so many have fallen um, into the trap of, of actually saying, well, I don't see anything wrong with same-sex relationships. It's sinful, it's wrong. It isn't God's way. And for many, many Christians um, in certain parts of the church who are actually saying, well, that's fine. Just you two fellas live together or you two ladies live together or you do what you want. That's wrong. You know, we've got nothing against these dear folks. It's just that it's the same as, as anybody else. They need to have Jesus in their lives. Then Jesus will change them, you know. And uh, we just need to love, the agape love. But sometimes it's right to say this is wrong. That's not God's love. 
So the challenge for you folks and for myself is to ask the Holy Spirit to fill us afresh with more love for those people that we meet. Because, because remember this, agape love, this love here, it points always, every single time, towards Jesus, towards his death on the cross, towards his resurrection on the third day, and the fact that he then sent the Holy Spirit for us. It always, always does it. That's the love. And it's, it's absolutely wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. The second thing we're going to look at today is, is the fruit of joy. We're going, to get, we're going to cover two fruits this week, you know, because there's so much in them. It's so rich of this. I don't want a, a rush through, so we're going to spend a few weeks looking at different fruits. So the next thing we look at is, is the fruit of joy. So you have love, then joy. Sometimes, I don't know if you noticed it, um, but sometimes we tend to um, downplay joy and, and happiness as somewhat too emotional for us British. Um, and I once had somebody say to me when I was grinning away in church, they said, oh, you're, oh, you're far too happy to be a Christian. You know, <laughs> you know, that's what they actually said to me, you know, you know you're smiling in church. I said, I said, yeah, I am. I said, oh, 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 well, that's unusual, isn't it? You know, we've, you know, we've got this thing, you know, we seem to have this thing, you know, among the British and in this nation that uh, sometimes we're not allowed to be joyful, that we either have to have long faces or we're to, or we're to uh, wander along looking depressed or fed up or, or not smile or anything like that. But let me tell you, it's, it's absolutely wrong, especially for the Christians. In New Testament words, the word joy here is the, way, is the word kara, which is C-H-A-R-A, kara. It's, it's a word which is related in original Greek to the word um, charis, or charis, uh, from which we uh, get the word charismatic. And that word charis, it means grace or gift, okay? It means grace or gift. And there's a second word, which it comes from, is the word charos, C-H-A-R-O-S, which means to rejoice or express joy. So really, you've got these two words, these two root, these two root words, which means grace or gift, and rejoice and express joy. So for example, um, uh, there is the grace to rejoice or, th or the gift that we have to express that joy. And we get this word chara. So, so can you get the picture of it? It means it's a gift that we've got the grace to do it and it means to rejoice or express joy. Not just to sit there and be, oh, I feel joyful. You're about to actually to show it as well, you know, and, and to actually act, act it. You know, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, I watched a thing on TV once when somebody said to somebody, I said, are you happy? Oh, yeah, I'm very happy. And this person said, well, let your face know it as well then. You know, tell your face that you're happy. You know, just don't let it inside. You'll tell your face as well. Um, so, so in other words, um, joy is the natural response to this gracious gift of God. In every instance in the Bible um, where joy is mentioned, it's always, it always, 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 originates from God, like joy in the Lord. I should be joyful at every time. And in fact, in the NIV version, which I read, it's mentioned 280 times in there. And that's just the word joy. Then there's things like joyful, which adds up about another 90 to 100 and so on and so on and so on. So there's lots of, so lots of joys and joyful there and be joyful and so on. And um, so it's very important. So, so why should we be joyful? Why should, why should we have joy? Because we can look around and think, well, actually, if you knew my life, I've got this happening, oh, my kids are doing this, this has happened, I've got problems at work, this has just happened, my cat's just had its tail run over or something like that, all of these different things. You know, why should I be joyful? Well, first and foremost, for us as Christians, and for any Christian, first and foremost is that you know Jesus as Lord, that you've had your sins taken away when you repented that day when you said Jesus I'm a sinner forgive me and you have been snatched from an eternal destiny in hell I tell you what if that doesn't make you smile I don't want to see some smiles out there you know, just now because all of you have been saved by Jesus wow isn't that amazing that we have been saved from hell by Jesus that should make us happy. That should make us joyful. It does me all the time. I remember vividly, as though that was a small in the breakfast, how I was 37 years ago, what my life was like. And every time I think about it, I thought, oh, my word. You know, that's like having a lottery win. You know, I've like 60 million quid all those years ago. And, you know, it's you know, you've totally transformed my life. 
and it's the same with all of you folks as well. So what is this joy? Well, since it's a fruit of, of Holy Spirit living in us, what it is, it's the connection between you, through the Holy Spirit living within you, through that fruit, back to God the Father. And it's a completed and restored a relationship again, um, as a sinner saved by Jesus, back into fellowship again with God. Okay, that's, that's why that joy is. It's like having that connection back. Now, Catherine, could you just uh, turn that light on for a second? We'll just turn it on. Right, so, well, just wait a second. So that light there, right, that's a person without Jesus. Turn it on. That's a person with Jesus, turn it off. That's a person without Jesus. That's a person with Jesus. I just turn it off and I'll just leave it like that. So, so there is no connection with the electricity, then there was collection. There's connection. No connection, then it was con- and then there was connection. And when there's a connection between us and God through the Holy Spirit, we shine. Can you see that? And that's when that joy comes in. Now, as a Christian, you can't lose that connection because Jesus has got you. He's grabbed you. You belong to him. And that's absolutely wonderful. But joy can come in different forms. I remember uh, many years ago when my, um, uh, uh, my older son, Barney, uh, went missing. He was six years old and, and he ran off when I was downtown. It was just me. I was, I was downtown shopping. In fact, I think I was getting some chips off the market. You know, so we, as we kind of disappeared. Well, we had police looking for him. We had probably two or three hundred people looking all over the place for him. I thought, oh, no, he's been snatched. But it wasn't. He just went down to a play park. He just ran off and went to a play park. But I was so joyful when he came back. He got smacked bum as well, but, um, you know, but I, was, I was so joyful that he was actually back. But the fruit of the Spirit goes further still than just when things, you know, good things happen. In James, Gospel, in James um, uh, chapter 1, it says this, uh, verse 2, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be uh, mature and complete, not lacking anything. Well, so there's a Bible saying that consider it joy whenever you face trials of many types. Wow. Isn't that something? So often the world thinks of joy as just being happy when we have positions or everything is going really, 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 really well. But what happens when not as all well? What happens then? That's the test of that fruit of joy within our lives and also that fruit of love. Like the scripture we just heard, when trials of various kinds come along, doesn't mean that we've got to go around you know, grinning like a muppet on speed. No, it doesn't. It, it doesn't. it doesn't actually mean that. And just declaring, oh, well, everything's well and good. Well, you know full well that it's not. Kind of denying the reality. Well, we mustn't do that. As Christians... Um, we must face head on all that seeks to pull us down. And there are lots of things, relationships, death, sudden death, all of these different things. But the joy of having Jesus in a life is like one of those World War II searchlights. You know, when you see them in the films, when they're going up in the dark sky, that's what that joy should be like in their lives. But sometimes it takes a while to start getting that fired up. And many new Christians here, that takes a while as you start to get closer into God. And that fruit of Jesus, you know, when we start having that love, um, it really does blind the world with that love and with that joy. So sometimes people say to me, well, you're a cheerful fella. And, and they ask me why. And as I say, well, I'll tell them about God's love for us. I'll tell them about the sacrificial love of Jesus on the cross, about how he died on the third day and how he saved me from hell. And I say to them, wouldn't that make you happy too? And often people respond to that and say, yes, tell me more about this Jesus. That's that joy that we have. So, if you want more of this, of this fruit of joy, think in this picture. If you stay indoors on a, on a really hot sunny day and you're pale skin like me, you, you'll stay pale. You really will. But if you go out in the sun, what's going to happen? Well, if you're like me, you're going to burn and you know, end up like a lobster. But, but that's the same as this joy, that the closer we get to Jesus, through his word, through prayer, through fellowship, through loving people, through just saying, Lord, would you help me to have this joy? That, that fruit is going to grow. It really does. It really does. Some of you may not believe me, but, but you put it to the test. You know, when things are, are, are difficult, just say, Lord, would you help me with this fruit of joy? 
it doesn't mean you've got to go grinning around, but it's something quite powerful in your life. Well, next week we're going to look 